Well, good afternoon. In, in kind of uh, you know, contemplative, and, and actually it's now, I think it's more and more happening here at Google and other places, we should start with one minute of arriving, right? Just stopping, just noticing what it's like to be here, noticing the body, noticing that you're breathing, arriving, just arriving. Simple, profound practice. And maybe asking yourself, what brought me here today? Why am I here? And you can, you can answer that literally or poetically. Why am I here? Why am I here in this room? Maybe why am I here on this planet? And then maybe the other question to reflect on is, uh, why am I really here? What's underneath, what's underneath that? To, as much as you can here in this busy work day to allow yourself to drop in, feel your body, feel your breath, noticing what it's like to be here. What is it like right now to be alive? Breathing, thinking, feeling, the whole experience, just allowing it, allowing yourself to experience your full experience. And then let's come back. Let's all come back. Well, welcome. So I want to start today with kind of one of my, my current kind of favorite saying, which is, if you're not cultivating trust, you're cultivating Cynicism. If you're not cultivating trust, you're cultivating cynicism. This is particularly true, I think, in the workplace, but I think it's true in general, in our lives and in our uh, relationships, that uh, cynicism is easy. Cynicism is kind of the default mode, I think, of human, human emotion in, in, a certain, in a certain way. Trust, trust takes work. And I want to bring in uh, someone who was a, uh, a colleague and a, uh, a good friend of mine who worked here at Google uh, for many, many years. Uh, his name is Mario. Some of you probably know Mario. So I think it's worth just a little bit of background about Mario. Um, Mario grew up in Spain and was passionate about how the human brain and how the human mind worked. So Mario went on to get his MD degree. Mario became a doctor. And he was very disappointed to find that doctors don't know how the brain works. So he then got his PhD in neuroscience and again was uh, somewhat disappointed to find out that neuroscientists, they don't know how the brain works. He then got passionate about storytelling and filmmaking and uh, got his master's degree in, uh, in filmmaking, and after that was hired by Google as a filmmaker. Right? Only Google right, would hire a MD, PhD as a filmmaker. Um, but his first couple of weeks here, he was walking by the main auditorium and saw a lot of people there, and he walked in, and he proceeded to see someone sitting on a seat giving a talk that there were hundreds of people listening to, and he immediately said, there's someone who knows how the brain works. There's someone who knows how the human mind works. It was Vietnamese Zen teacher uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. And this actually kind of changed uh, Mario's life. And it was right around that time that um, I was one of the people helping to develop the Search Inside Yourself program here at Google. And Mario immediately uh, was, was in one of the early classes. Mario, the reason I bring Mario up now is he was very fond of saying that, that we human beings are descendants of the nervous apes. The apes that were chill, cool, hanging out, they all got killed. <laughs> it was the ones that part of our evolution was that as humans, we've evolved to scan for threats, right? We scan for threats externally, and we also are scanning 
quite regularly internally for threats. I think this is partly why we seem to have this strong inner critic, this part of us that is, that is sweeping inside for am I safe, did I do it wrong, how can I do it better, that, that very often unpleasant, sometimes mean inner voice. But this is, this is one reason why it's so difficult to build trust and why cynicism is so easy because of this scanning for threats and that we are descendants of the nervous apes. And we're also, um, I, I, I didn't get a chance, I hope to have a chance to talk about this with Mario, but I, I think we're also descendants of what I would call the dissatisfied apes, right? That part of our human evolution is to always be needy, to always feel like we need that next meal, right? It, it wouldn't be good for evolution if after having one meal you were done, right? Right away, that next meal, that next entertainment, that next sex, all those things. These are good for evolution, not so good for trust and feeling a sense of satisfaction. And we're also the descendants of the apes that we have empathy, but we also easily feel separate. Even though we feel, even though we feel the feelings of others, we're empathic. We are descendants of these tribal apes and apes that very easily bring in the, the, the mind of dissatisfaction and the nervous ape mind to feel a sense of separateness, to feel that somehow we're separate from others, even kind of separate from nature, separate from life. We have this really strong piece about feeling uh, separate. So I think this is why Und what the underlying rationale for why it's so difficult to be cultivating trust and why it's so easy to be cultivating uh, cynicism. So what do we do? How, how can we cultivate trust? And how can we reduce the amount of cynicism? So for this, I want to tell kind of a, just a little corny joke, uh, which is it's about a, uh, a musician who's getting out of a cab Midtown Manhattan on 57th Street. And a stranger goes up to this person and says, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the musician looks at this person and says, practice. <laughs> practice. Practice. So this is, my, this is my answer to how do we build more trust? It's practice. And, and I, I, like, I like the word practice. And, and I like, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of books and about you know, the seven habits and how to build habits. And habits are really important. But I think practice adds a whole other dimension. That practice contains a sense of intention. Intention, aspiration. Also, with practice, practices I think are about transforming ourselves and embodying, embodying what it is we're aiming for as, as human beings, right? It's one, thing, it's one thing to say, you know, you hear a lot, you know, it's on, it's on dozens of greeting cards, right? Life is short, right? Live as though life is short. That's easy to say. But how do you, how do you live that way? How do you live that way? And it's easy to say. We all know that trust is hard to build, hard to maintain. But how can we actually uh, transform ourselves to embody, to become trustworthy, to trust ourselves, to connect, to not, to reduce the amount that we're scanning for threats, to find, to have the body of someone who feels safe. To be able to not always look at what's missing, to not always be dissatisfied, but to build the body of someone who feels that I have enough right now. I can appreciate what I have right now. And to build the body of someone who feels connected, radically connected. And part of that, of course, is noticing when we're scanning for threats, noticing when we're needy, and noticing when we feel dissatisfied or disconnected. This is part of the practice. So 
seven practices. There are seven practices that I want to introduce today that in a way I think are uh, radically powerful in terms of building the body of someone who is trustworthy and who can build trust, not only at work, but in all, uh, all parts of our lives and all relationships. And these seven practices are love the work, do the work, don't be an expert, connect to your pain, connect to the pain of others, depend on others, and keep making it simpler. I love the, I, I, I find saying these, it's kind of like poetry, right? right? Love the work, do the work, don't be an expert, connect to your pain, connect to the pain of others, depend on others, and keep making it simpler. But they're meant to be very practical. They're meant to be practiced. Uh, where do these come from? So a little story about where these come from. Van, I don't know, Van, were you in the first class of SIY teachers? Oh, no, well, no, no, no. No, okay, you came, you came on later. Um, I doubt there's anyone here who was in that class. Is there? <laughs> so, um, so it was back, uh, I, I got a call one day in, um, in 2006 from this engineer here named Meng who said, uh, we're starting this mindfulness and emotional intelligence program. Are you interested in coming and helping us uh, to develop it? Oh, he said, oh, and by the way, uh, there's no budget. <laughs> there's, something, there's something a little strange about this, uh, Google, no budget. But I, of course, I said yes. And I came. And it was, it was so just brilliantly fun and enlivening and satisfying the first uh, I mean, at, at the time, we were just kind of experimenting and testing and iterating how to teach mindfulness, emotional intelligence, leadership, science within an organization like Google. Uh, and in particular, we were focusing on, on Google engineers, and there needed to be a kind of a precision around it. And um, after, after several years, it actually was kind of slow. And in fact, I, I often thought the course would probably go away because it wasn't, it wasn't originally being supported by senior management. But it's, it got more and more popular. And then it got kind of crazy popular. And, uh, and we decided that it was time to figure out how to scale it within Google. And we decided we were going to train about a dozen Google employees, mostly engineers, to be search inside yourself teachers. But the question, one of the big questions was, how do you train people to be mindfulness teachers? Uh, we, we had this idea that in order to teach mindfulness, you needed to have 10,000 hours of mindfulness meditation practice. This was, this was one of the bars originally set for teaching Search Inside Yourself. But we realized that that was going to eliminate pretty much everyone uh, in, at, at Google. So we wanted to find people who had some practice. But the question was, what do you need to know? What, what are the core elements of being a, a mindfulness teacher? So uh, we decided that we'd bring in to this one of the training sessions a, a friend of mine, a man named Norman Fisher, who is kind of one of the leading uh, Zen teachers uh, in the world. And we brought Norman in for a day. Um, this was in the Presidio with about a dozen uh, Google employees who we were training to be mindfulness teachers. And, and when this day started, uh, in front of me was the agenda, and I don't even, t I don't know who quite made up this agenda, but it said right away that Norman was going to give a talk about how to be a mindfulness teacher at Google. And I had a feeling no one told this to Norman. So I, so I very, very stealthily just put the agenda in front of Norman and pointed, you know, you're going you're to give a talk in about five minutes. And, and Norman very nonchalantly got out a pen and a piece of paper and wrote down some notes and proceeded to give a talk to this group about these seven practices that I just named. And I wrote them down. Most people didn't write them down. I wrote them down. And I, I immediately, I felt like these are wonderful. In fact, these express the kind of culture that I want to run my company, the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. I, I made copies of them 
wrote a little notes, and I put them on everyone's desk. And I found myself starting to write and talk about them. And little by little, I noticed they started to turn into a book started to emerge after a, a couple of years of writing and talking about these seven practices. And I started to feel funny. And I realized I need to call Norman and have a, what might be a difficult conversation. So I called Norman. Norman, here's what happened. Remember those seven practices that you taught? I'm booked about. Of course, Norman's listening. And Norman says, what seven practices? I have no idea what you're talking about. And uh, good luck with your book. And send me a copy. So that's, um, that's, where, these, uh, that's where these seven practices uh, came from. So maybe what I'll do is um, just talk. I want to talk briefly about, these, about each of these practices and then actually do some practice together. How's that sound? OK. Don't leave if you don't want to. That sounds difficult. You'll, it'll be OK. Uh, so um, the first practice is love the work. People, when they hear that, they immediately think, oh, that means do I have to love the, my job? It doesn't mean that. It's, it's good if you love your job. But what it means is to love the work of cultivating trust, to love the work of self-awareness, to love the work of building healthy relationships, of kindness, of curiosity, of compassion. This is, this, is, this is, I think, the real work of human beings. And what's beautiful about this is that you can bring this in to whatever you're doing, even if you're not so happy, even if you're cynical about your work or the people around you are cynical. Loving the work will help. Loving the work, in a way, it's, it's a kind of practice of being more sincere. Also, um, I like, it, it relates a bit to, you might be familiar with, uh, there's a model uh, called the hero's journey. Uh, Joseph Campbell wrote about how all humans across time and across cultures seem to go through a similar pattern. And the, the first part of the hero's journey, actually Star Wars was modeled after the hero's journey. Uh, as with Star Trek and many other, many books and movies. And uh, the hero's journey starts with the calling. What are you called to? What, again, this question that I asked right at the beginning, uh, why are you here? What, what, bring, what brings you here? Why are you here on this planet? What's really most important to you? So loving the work is, is grappling with that, that question. What's interesting in that, uh, even in the hero's journey model, uh, the second step after awakening to a calling, a kind of returning home, is uh, called refusing the call. Right? Because this is, the, this is the nervous ape. This is the dissatisfied ape just coming. As soon as we even get some clarity about what's important to us, there's something there that's like, no, this is, this is too dangerous. Uh, I might fail. Why would I do that? Who am I to do that? So it's good to recognize that part of, uh, part of loving the work is that these, uh, these refusals, these other, these other voices will be there. And part of the practice, this is why practice is so important. How do we practice with those, those voices? So the second practice is uh, do the work. That, it's, that practice is more than an idea. We actually have to have some kind of physical practice that we're doing. And this is the beauty of meditation practice and mindfulness practice. So meditation practice, actually having some way where on a daily basis or regular basis, we can actually step in to the body that is feeling safe and become more aware of how we are scanning for threats. And over and over again, practice reducing that from our lives as much as we can. So we're feeling a sense of safety. We can embody the sense of satisfaction. Uh, we, we, don't, you know, we don't have to be chopping up the world into right and wrong and worrying about what we need or what we should be doing. We're, we're kind of cultivating that, that sense. Uh, and we're feeling this radical 
uh, sense of uh, connection. I want to, I, it's funny, being here I have to tell another Mario story. Mario and I were once teaching Search Inside Yourself here at Google. It was a special program that we were doing for uh, doctors and healthcare workers. I think because, I don't know how it is now, at the time they weren't employees so they weren't eligible to take Search Inside Yourself. But we heard there was a huge need that there was an incredible amount of stress uh, with the people who provide uh, medical services here at Google. So Mario and I did um, a, a one day program for them. And it was in that program where Mario was in front of the room and said, it was actually a slide that, I don't know if it's still in the program or not, but it said, uh, meditation is like going to the gym. And it had a picture of a, a muscle. Cause, and and the, the idea was again and again, when we are distracted, we bring our attention back uh, to the breath. Well, I, I was just moved in that moment to go off script. And I stood up and I said, I want to offer that meditation is nothing like going to the gym. And Mario, fortunately Mario and I had a good enough relationship where he just, he kind of stood up and he looked at me and, he, and looked at the audience and said, that's why we have two teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said that yes, there is an aspect of meditation that's like going to the gym. But there's another aspect that it's about completely letting go of wanting to change anything or do any, it's this paradoxical piece about completely accepting what is. And that transformation comes, comes through that, which is actually kind of a good, um, maybe a good segue into the next couple of practices. But the second practice, doing the work, means to have some kind of a regular, what I would call a dedicated practice, a sitting practice, a journaling practice, walking meditation, and then the other bucket of practices is what we refer to as integrated practices. And this is often what people think of when they think about mindfulness, is taking, taking that, the, that embodiment of, of safety, of satisfaction, of connection, that body that is completely accepting, aware, curious, and bringing that into all of our relationships as much as we can again and again. So this is, this is the second practice, which is to, to do, do the work. Uh, the third practice, uh, don't be an expert. Don't be an expert. Again, I feel like it's kind of in the, in the water these days, some of this language. The language you might be familiar with is kind of cultivating a beginner's mind. So just to make it clear, of course I want my surgeon and my car mechanic to be really good at what they do. But, but this this practice is more in the realm of relationship and, and being human. And, and in, this was in the context, again, coming back to where these practices came from. This, the context was being a mindfulness teacher is not about being an expert. It's again and again practicing not knowing, letting go, letting, like, um, it's funny, so often, when I'm teaching meditation in the corporate world, I can see people really wanting to be good at it and wanting to be the best meditator, you know, or the best breath counter. And it's like, no, you need to, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard for us, especially people who are super, super successful, to somehow uh, paradoxically to let go of this idea of being an expert. And what is it like? So in some way, one of the themes, and I think this is a theme that runs through all of these practices, and this is some of the, a little bit of the practice that we will do, it's the practice of listening, and listening wholeheartedly, listening with a sense of curiosity. Uh, you know, when we, when we started the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, the original mission and vision was all leaders in the world are wise and compassionate thus creating the conditions for a more peaceful world or for world peace. And, and, and it's easy to roll your eyes, you know, world peace, you know, all leaders. But there's something about the power of listening, the power of creating a safe space and just listening, being curious about, one, even listening to ourselves, right, starting with ourselves. But it's really interesting, and we'll do some listening practice in a little while, of actually just bringing our full attention to another person, 
not knowing who they are. It's the secret of long-term relationships. I think it's the secret of long-term marriages is the longer you're married, to know the person less and less, right? To, to, that this person, like as soon as, as soon as we know who people are, we generally stop listening. So powerful practice. Uh, don't be an expert. The next two, uh, connect to your pain and connect to the pain of others. The first one, connect to your own pain, a little bit like you know, Buddhism 101 starts with like the four, the four noble truths, the, the very first teaching of the historical Buddha was don't push away what's difficult. Embrace, embrace what's difficult. Being a human being is difficult. It just is. We're subject, you know, everything, everything really does change. You know, I, I've often joke about wanting to form a, a support group called Buddhists Against Change. Because uh, I don't like it. You know, who likes, who likes getting older? Who likes seeing friends die? Who likes you know, losing jobs? Or, um, that life, life is, is difficult. So this practice is to connect with that difficulty. You know, there's um, there's a, a lot of evidence, a good deal of research, but I think in particular of a, a conversation that I had a, a several years ago with Bill George, who wrote the book True North and who works with uh, Fortune 500 CEOs and executives. And at a dinner that I had with him, he shared with me that the key breakthrough that all leaders need to have is to connect with their own sense of pain and even sometimes shame. But this is like there's a positive shame. It's like the shame of I'm not doing enough. I could connect better. So connecting, connecting with that sense of pain. And connecting with the pain of others is, again, this is uh, empathy practice, the practice of feeling the feelings of, of others. Lots of research about the relationship between uh, leadership, emotional intelligence, and empathy. And uh, oddly enough, you, you might have seen some of this research. It shows that the, the higher you are in an organization, the more responsibility that you take, the lower the empathy is a, is a pattern. And, and yet the need for empathy in leaders becomes greater and greater, the need to connect with people. I think what happens is as, as people take on more leadership roles, their focus tends to be more toward, toward the results and, and toward you know, other things other than the human beings that they're actually there for and need to care for. So love the work, do the work, don't be an expert, connect to your pain, connect to the pain of others. Uh, the sixth one, super interesting, and again, all of these, all of these are like lifetime practices. We're not, it's not about mastering these, it's about practicing them. Depend on others. Actually, in there, I cite two Google studies, which I, I kind of imagine, maybe you're all familiar, but maybe none of you are. Who knows? I don't know what you're familiar with. But if you, if you haven't checked them out, you should check out uh, Google Aristotle, right? the study that Google did several years ago asking the question, what is it that makes great teams? And, and Google Oxygen, uh, the, the question, what is it that makes great leaders? And the results of both of these were the, the first study, right? The, what, what it is that makes great teams was that people are listening to each other, that they are trusting each other. They called it psychological safety. There was norms created around, around trust. And the, the, the big takeaway to the second study, uh, Google Oxygen, what makes great leaders? It was more coaching, uh, more mentoring. And the third was listening, that great leaders listen. And, and what I've read in the, in the preamble to this study, Google assumed that leaders don't matter, right? The, the assumption, this being such a strong uh, engineering-driven company, the, the assumption was it's the products that matter, not the leadership. And they were actually surprised to find that leaders, in fact, uh, do matter. So depend on others. Again, this is, I think, uh, one of the huge changes in the workplace that's happening is there's a, sh I think there's this huge macro shift happening that we're all part of this big experiment is, you know, work for the past several hundred years has had this assembly line mentality. There is a sense that, the, that you should take the humanness out of workers and, and have put people into boxes, 
you know, org charts. Uh, and things will work great if you just, if the, if the human element isn't, isn't there. That is changing, and it's changing big time at places here like Google, and I see it. I see it all over, and it's, it's one of those norms, it's one of those invisible assumptions about just how important human relationships are. And partly it's because of the need for collaboration, that we that n almost nothing gets done by one person. Things get done in teams, uh, teams of two, larger teams, and things are now happening across the globe, across culture. The need for collaboration has never been higher. So this practice of uh, depend on others. And the seventh is uh, maybe one of the hardest ones, but one of the most important, is to keep making it simpler. To keep making it simpler. Again, this goes against the grain of what it feels like in terms of not only technology, but the part of us that's scanning for threats and feeling dissatisfied and not feeling connected. That leads to lots and lots of complication. So in a way, all these practices are about making our lives uh, simpler. Staying, coming back, coming back to this question that we started with is like, why are you here? What's, what's really important? Something about staying with what's really important and other, other things tend to drop away. Oh, let's do some practice, okay? So if you can put things down, put things away. And again, I want, I want to make this, um, this is not gonna be mystical, magical, it's gonna be quite Quite simple and accessible, easy. And, you know, and we'll get to the mystical, magical piece, maybe. We'll see. But just, just start by noticing what it's like to be sitting here. Make some conscious choices about how you are placing your feet, how you're placing your hands. Bring some consciousness into the body. I love the image. In fact, this was an early, we used to show a slide called Sit Like a Majestic Mountain. It's a beautiful image of the body, right? That we're sitting here, sitting upright, opening the chest, opening the shoulders, uh, allowing breathing to be full. Often we constrict it without knowing it. So just feeling the sense of what is it like to be relaxed, Relaxing the jaw, relaxing the shoulders, and at the same time, alert. Just this is such a great practice for all parts of our lives, right? Don't we, whether we're trying to solve a problem or in a meeting or playing sports, relaxed and alert, relaxed and alert. The alert piece, be lengthening the spine just a little bit. Taking some full breaths, especially this time of day, a little hard to be alert, middle of the day, warm day. So oxygenating the body, breathing, breathing in and breathing out. So just checking in with the body, checking in with the breath, Noticing whatever's happening with your thinking mind. Again, no need to try and change anything. Just bringing awareness to the body, to the breath, to your thoughts. Totally letting go as much as you can of any scanning for threats, of any, there's nothing lacking right now, right now. You have everything that you need, everything that needs to happen. It'll all be there when you leave here. Right now, safe, satisfied. And can you feel that sense of connection? Connection with yourself, connection with the people in this room, connection with the people who are important to you in your life and connection with life.
I heard someone say recently, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The, op the opposite of addiction is connection. Connection is so important. And I think something important for our well-being, important for trusting ourselves and for building, trusting, healthier relationships, connection. So quieting, quieting that critical voice, quieting that cynical voice, not, not suppressing it, noticing it. Appre maybe what would it be like to appreciate, appreciate that inner critic that I think just really wants us to be safe? So this practice, there's a Zen teacher who founded the Zen tradition in Japan in the 13th century named Dogen who says, this practice is about studying the self and going beyond the self. Uh, to study the way is to study the self. Uh, to study the self is to go beyond the self. And to go beyond the self is to feel our radical connection with everyone and everything. To me, this is another way of talking about practice, these practices of studying ourselves, accepting ourselves, seeing the gaps between where we are and maybe where we aspire to be. So let's keep it simple, just breathing in and breathing out. And let's just sit quietly together for a minute. Beautiful, uh, bringing tension back. So if everyone can stand up, please. And feel free to stretch from sitting. So, and what I'd like to ask you to do is, without talking, and pretty quickly, find a partner. Find someone. You can just turn to the person next to you. You can walk around, someone you know, or someone you don't know. But find someone and have a seat. And I'll give you some instructions. OK, so every, anyone need a partner? Is there anyone who needs a partner? Need a partner? So here's what we're going to do. So what we want to do is, is do, some, do some practice. Practice this taking, taking what we just did in stopping, but now taking it into a, a conversation. So one person is going to speak. The other person is just going to listen without asking questions. Some of you taken SIY, you know, you know the routine, but many of you probably haven't. Um, but I'm going to tell it different anyhow. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, one person is just going to listen, completely giving their attention to the person who's speaking. So what I want to suggest for the listener, see what it's like. Just experiment. You don't have to sit there like a stone. You can you know, make facial expressions and be in your body. But you're not going to ask questions. You're not going to interrupt. You're going to experiment. Is what is it like? to just listen. For the person who's speaking, um, I want to suggest that you don't need to be impressive, uh, that it's OK to imagine saying something that surprises you. This would be great, that, that you're, uh, you, you're kind of discovering for yourself. It's OK to be a, a, a little bit awkward. Uh, 
If you run out of time, person speaking, that's okay. Just sit there quietly. We're just going to do this just pretty quick for a couple minutes for one person, and then we'll, we'll switch. So the suggested topic, I have two suggested topics. Um, uh, one is the original qu questions. What brought you here today? And what really brought you here today? Or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, because who knows, who knows when you're going to get this opportunity to have someone just listen to you for two, we'll do this like for two, literally for like two minutes. It's a great opportunity. Uh, so, let's, um, so let's just jump right in. So decide who's going to speak first. And I'll ring a bell in a couple minutes, and then we'll switch. So let's go ahead. <laughs> Okay. And let's all just take a breath together. And the second person, you're in the listener's now the speaker, the speaker's now the listener. Again, I'll ring a bell in a couple of minutes. Go ahead. And the second person finishing. And then just very briefly with your partner back and forth, how was that? What did you notice? Literally for a minute, just quickly, what did you notice doing that with your partner? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing and thanking your partner, and come on back. <laughs> Lots of energy. Uh, clearly, they don't let you talk to each other here, generally. <laughs> you should try it more often. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. Although, it's funny, as I was, um, while you were talking, I realized, oh, I, I skipped a whole big part of what I wanted to say, so we have to start over again. Ah. <laughs> Actually, we don't. Uh, but the, the, the headline for what I wanted to say was I, I, I forgot to talk at all about my, my experience you know, living in a Zen monastery and how it was, it, was working, it was working in the kitchen and then leading this uh, place called Tasahara that was my kind of uh, aha and inspiration for combining these contemplative practices, integrating these with the world of work. And I ended up going to business school, running, running a company. And, and, and then in, 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 in part, you know, I think part of the sense was how can, we bring, how can we bring that sense of joy and love that, that I experience and that people, a lot of people who I've worked with experience working in a Zen kitchen, why, isn't all, why, why aren't all workplaces like that? And how could we bring that in to Google was where Search Inside Yourself started. OK, any questions, comments? Anyone make a new best friend doing that? Um, <laughs> yeah, get you a mic. I'll try to frame the question as clearly as I can, because there are too many thoughts in my head. Um, I haven't found the purpose of my life, and I've questioned this for a very long time. And I think because I couldn't, you make little purposes, like, for example, a promotion, a bigger house, or, or whatever that you can, like the, the next fancy thing that you can get your hands on to. I do want to feel satisfied. I feel ashamed to say this. I hate people who feel satisfied in their life. <laughs> I just don't know how they do it. Um, I do want to feel satisfied, but I'm very scared. If I get satisfied with what I have, would I lose the, the ambition or wanting to be better or, or maybe achieve more that I could have otherwise? Great question. Yeah. I think we, um, 
Well, let's see, uh, several things there. One is I wouldn't get too hung up about this, this thing about like having a purpose and, and that. So I'll give, I, sometimes I feel like my role, I'm like the Wizard of Oz, right? What's the difference between you and someone who doesn't have, you know, who needs a purpose? So I want to give you something that says, your purpose, be the best human being you can be. Be the best human being you can be. And I think you already have that, just like the people in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so I think, um, I think in our culture, and, and, and our culture, I think, has managed to, uh, to really uh, infiltrate this idea, this idea that we have to, not only do we have to want things, but we need to be tough on ourselves. A lot of people either very consciously or almost unconsciously feel like, if I'm not tough on myself, if I'm not hard on myself, nothing's going to happen. And there's some great research now. There's, um, Kristen Neff is doing a lot of research on this whole realm of self-compassion and, and demonstrating that actually the more we love ourselves, the more creative we can be, the more we can get done. So there's a funny, there's, it's very nuanced and, and funny. I, I don't think you ever have to worry about the, so the desire to excel. The de, so there's, there's a paradox even when I say be the best person you can be. I thought you're supposed to accept yourself the way you are. Yes, and yes, like, like part of being, part of acceptance is accepting where we are and looking for what's the gap between that and where we really want to be. In a accepting way, though, not in a beating ourselves up way. In fact, there's an um, expression. Uh, these are called kind of creative gaps, right? So, so part, of this, part of this awareness is, is recognizing, recognizing, oh, my mind is really busy, and I'd like to work on that. Or uh, I'm, um, I'm judging myself a lot, and I'd like, to, I'd like to be scanning for threats less. So to work, to work on that, to, to, but to accept it, to see what is, to have the courage to see what is, and to practice with what can I do to become a, a better, more thriving human being. And there's a beautiful expression from uh, uh, Shinru Suzuki, who was the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center. He was once doing a long-term retreat with people, and he looked out and said, you're all perfect just as you are, and you could use a little improvement. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think what's brilliant about that is to, they're not opposed to each other. Our minds make them opposed to each other. What if you were perfect as you are, and what if you were working toward becoming even better? That's part of the paradox. Yeah, get a mic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Van. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any tip for like improving meditation. So I started meditation like a few months ago, and just five minutes, it's very effective. I feel refreshed. But now there is like uh, usually it's just 10 or 15 minutes a day. I, I feel like stuck and not improving. Like improving, I still like uh, constantly wandering, and then also like I, I feel like maybe after practicing, I will feel more happier or more refresher yeah. after meditation. I just, for the past like, uh, two months, I feel stuck. Yeah. Any, any also, if it's uh, like a chair, like, like I mentioned, it's really like a special chair for meditation? No, no special chair. And, and my short answer, we could talk more about this, but th my short answer is tr try doing a retreat. Do a one-day retreat or a three-day or try it. Just see what happens. I want to respect time, and I see that it is, um, it is 1 o'clock. And I also want to... Um, um, yeah, the, I hope, I know some of you were lucky enough to get here early and got a copy of my book. For some reason, Amazon, I don't know why, they're selling it at a ridiculously low price. They're almost <laughs> giving it away. I don't know why that is, uh, but you can, you, can, uh, you can go on and buy my book on Amazon. Of course, write reviews would be so appreciated. I have a mailing list over here if you want to, um, I, I'm now... Uh, I'm doing a weekly newsletter. Incredible benefits to being, uh, just sign up for my mailing list. You can always unsubscribe. And um, I also do a regular um, Wednesday night meditation group in the North Bay in Mill Valley. If you're ever up there, come join me there. And marklesser.net is my, my M-A-R-C.
And it's, um, it's just, it's such an honor to be back here at Google, and I hope to get to spend more time back here at Google. And thank you, Van and Anthony. Much appreciated. And thank you all. <laughs>